Long time no see. I know it's been a it's been a while. How you doing, guys? I'm so happy to have you back here again. I'm so happy to be back. I know I've been gone for quite a while. I've been MIA for quite a while, but let me tell you, it wasn't due to my own choice. Life just happened. A lot of things happened. A lot of unexpected things happened. So I had to take a little bit of a step back to try to get my things together. I recently became a father in 2023 to a beautiful baby girl. So, and her name is Itumeleng, by the way. And for those of you who are not familiar with the language, Itumeleng means be happy. And the reason I named her Itumeleng is because she makes me want to be happy. So as soon as my child was born, I had to get a lot of my priorities in order. And I had to shift a lot of my focus to being a father, to adjusting to being a new parent. So a lot of things in my life took a back seat. But that does not mean I did not miss this work. I did. Because if you remember correctly, I was supposed to come back. I was supposed to come back at the beginning of 2023. But then I uploaded one video and then I left. Right? It's because of that. But I'm really sorry, guys, for being gone for so long. So, yeah, I'm happy. I'm happy to be back. I hope you guys are good. I hope you guys are ready for another video for more content because I'm going to try to be as consistent as I possibly can. And uh, before we get into it, I also noticed that the subscriber count was still going up even in my absence. So with that being said, I wanted to say thank you. Thank you, guys, to those who've been sharing my videos, to those who've been consuming my content even in my absence thank you thank you so much for the support and to those that are new to the channel welcome 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 i am so excited to have you guys here and i hope you and i are going to be interacting quite a lot in these videos in the comment section and if you are still watching and you haven't subscribed yet i just wanted to say to you if you are a fan of true crime and you'd like to hear more about these cases in great detail this is the channel for you. So please do hit that subscribe button for weekly uploads. All right then, guys, let's get into it. Now, the case that we're going to be talking about is actually quite an intriguing one. And the reason I say that is because it's, it's, it's one of the most pu puzzling cases that I've ever had to cover on my channel. And I cannot wait to hear what you guys think about this because I'm at a loss for words. To this day, the case is unsolved. So I just wanted to touch on it just so I can see what kind of theories you guys may have, especially when I get to the part of the investigation of the case and the leads that police were getting and all of that. So I just want to know what you guys are going to think about this one, because it definitely left me at a loss for words. Between the years of 2003 and 2006, 11 women were reported missing and thereafter 11 bodies of women were buried by an unknown person in an Arroyo Bank on Albuquerque's West Mesa. This was an undeveloped area within city limits and there were satellite images that were also taken that actually showed tire tracks and some patches of disturbed soil where the bodies of, this, of these women were actually discovered. And according to the satellite images, the last of the women, of the 11 women, was buried in 2006. And then on February 2nd in 2009, a woman and her husband were both walking their dog when they came across what looked like a bone. Now, as soon as they saw it coming out of the ground, they were not really sure if it was a human bone or if it was perhaps an animal bone. But luckily, the woman had a sister who worked as a nurse at the time so what they decided to do was they took a picture of the bone and they sent it to her for confirmation and as soon as she saw the bone she knew right there and then that this was a human bone and as soon as the sister confirmed that this is actually a human bone the woman and her husband knew right there and then that they had to call the police and report this discovery and as soon as the police started investigating this uh, human bone that was discovered they then discovered an entirely new kind of weird and that is a mass grave that is filled with many many other bones and this is when the investigation started into the west mesa bone collector case as they discovered the remains they discovered that these are the remains of women young girls and the remains of an unborn 
child. And I will talk about the victims briefly as we go along. And uh, it is said that most of them were involved in sex work and some form of drug use. And as I've already mentioned, the remains were found in 2009. So not only the remains that were found by that woman and her husband, but the remains of all the other victims as well. Because as soon as police discovered that bone that was reported, they then uncovered all the other remains. Then on December 9th in 2010, police released six other photos of other women who were not identified, and it was believed that they could have been linked to the other 11 women who were found in the mass grave at West Mesa. But even though police did not exactly state how these photos were obtained, they did actually show some noticeable things about these six women. In these pictures, these women seemed to be unconscious, and a lot of them had a lot of similar characteristics to the 11 women that I've talked about so far. Then just on the following day, police released another photo on December 11th in 2010 of another woman. However, this time around, this woman ended up being identified by her family, and they said that she had died of natural causes. So just to be clear, these women are not to be confused with the original 11 victims I've talked about so far. Police were just trying to see if they could be linked to this case. But nothing indicates in my research that they ended up coming forward with any information that could have helped the police. So like I said, I'm going to talk a little bit about the victims so you guys can actually know who these victims are. And the first victim to be identified after investigators took the remains for analysis was 26-year-old Victoria Chavez. And uh, she was identified using dental records on February 11th. And according to my sources, she had actually been missing for about a year before being officially reported missing by her family in March of 2005. Now, Victoria was a sex worker and she was on probation at the time of her disappearance. She was found about 18 inches underground and she was naked with nothing that police could use to try to identify her. And then around February 18th, the number of remains that have been uncovered went up to six. And as this was happening, Victoria's remains had now been officially completed. Then by February 24th, the number of remains had now went up to 10. And at this time, the Albuquerque police decided to get the FBI involved and some archaeologists as well to try to help out with identifying these remains and also to try to uncover any other parts or any other sets of remains that have not yet been discovered. Now, unfortunately, the next set of remains that were found were also found with smaller remains within them. This led investigators to believe that the next woman that I'm about to speak about was unfortunately pregnant at the time of her murder. And then as more investigation was done, it was discovered that she was actually four months pregnant at the time of her death. And after using dental records to also identify this next woman, she was identified to be 22-year-old Gina Michelle Valdez. So she preferred to go by Michelle, so I'll be referring to her as Michelle throughout her part of the case. Michelle was described as a people person, someone who always looked out for the next person. She would always be dedicating herself. She was a dedicated mother, dedicating herself to the daughter that she already had at that time. So she was about to be a mother of two kids. Michelle had dreams and she dreamed of becoming a lawyer and a singer. However, life ended up happening. As we all know, life can be quite unexpected. Life ended up happening and she found herself being distant from her family and she would disappear for days at a time when she started being involved in substance abuse. However, as time went on, those days would end up turning into months. So her family wouldn't see her for quite a long time, but she would always be checking in every now and then. And that's how they knew that she was still okay. Because in some instances, she would call to ask for money. And when this happened, her father would use it as an opportunity to try to get her to come back home. And even though at some point it seemed like she would come back home, she would just again disappear. Michelle's father reported her missing in February of 2005. And according to her mother, she heard some rumors from numerous sources that Michelle had been stabbed multiple times and then dumped in the West Mesa. But whenever these rumors or these new leads of information would be taken to the police, Unfortunately, the police wouldn't really take them that seriously. And this wasn't just in the case of Michelle. You'll also hear even with the other victims that I'm going to talk about as well, that not a lot of leads were taken seriously by police. 
and it was believed that this was due to the fact that these women were sex workers. And as we all know, in a lot of communities, even today, sex workers are not really taken that seriously. Then by the 28th of February, 11 remains of 11 women have been discovered. However, most of them were still not identified. And among those remains, like I said, were the remains of an unborn child. So at this point, remember, it was still just Victoria Chavez, as well as Michelle Valdez, who were identified. And then soon after this, the third woman was identified, and her name was Cinnamon Elks. And she was only 32 years old at the time of her murder. Cinnamon was the oldest victim among all these other women, and she had quite a lengthy criminal record. Now, even though Cinnamon's family knew that she was a grown woman and they didn't need to keep tabs on her all the time, when she did not call them on her birthday, that's when they knew that something had to be wrong because no matter what happened, Cinnamon always called on her birthday. And her birthday was around August, so this is when they knew that something had to be terribly wrong. Cinnamon's mom is the one who reported her missing, but like I said, first time around, police did not take these cases quite seriously. So even with her, when she went to go report her daughter missing at the police station, they told her that Cinnamon was an adult, she was a grown woman, and she did not need to report to her parents all the time. Now, Cinnamon's mom said that she also heard rumors that her daughter, before she disappeared, kept talking about a dirty cop. She said that this dirty cop would pick women up, would pick up sex workers to go chop their heads off and then bury them in West Mesa. And then the fourth victim to be identified also by dental records was 24-year-old Julie Niero. Julie was a young mom who really, really cared about her family. But now, unfortunately, at the age of 19, she started getting involved in drug use. And this is when things started spiraling out of control in her life. However, I do have to say that Julie did take efforts in trying to get clean. And it was said that the reason she was trying so many times to get drug free was for her son. So she always made the attempt at all times. But as we all know, drug addiction is not something that you can easily get rid of. So no matter how many times she tried, she always found herself getting back into it. But she was trying to do it for her son. Julie was reported missing in August of 2004. However, as avid true crime consumers, we all know at this point that as soon as she was reported missing, police didn't take her case that seriously as well. And I gotta say, it's quite terrifying to think about that if you go and report your loved one missing, because of how old they are, or because of the line of work that they're in, or because of the choices that they make in their lives, they may not be taken seriously, their disappearance, May not, taken, may not be taken that seriously just because of who they are or what they do with their lives. It's, it's terrifying to think of that human life can be reduced to that. Investigators also discovered that these four women that I've talked about so far actually knew one another. And so they thought that perhaps this could assist them with finding the reasoning behind their murders. Now, in my opinion, this is not official. In my opinion, I'm thinking that perhaps the police thought that this person who could have done this could have been someone that they all closely knew, or maybe this, this person could have been a client at some point who met them individually through each other. But that's just what I think about it. I just want to know what you think about this part of the information that they somehow knew one another. Then in early April, in early April, two more women were identified by police. And the first of these women was 22-year-old Monica Candelaria. Monica was described to be a family-oriented person. And she always wanted to make sure that those around her were smiling at all times. And she loved her kids. Monica was last seen on May 11th in 2003. And she was reported missing about two weeks later. Now, according to reports, Monica's friends also came forward with some rumors that they heard that she was also snatched and then taken to West Mesa to be murdered there. Now, police did try to investigate this rumor at that time, right before they discovered all the other victims. However, nothing indicates that anything was found to be used as a lead in this case. And with that being said, Monica's case ended up being handed over to the cold case unit 
when no other leads could be found regarding her disappearance. Then the second woman to be identified in early April was 26-year-old Veronica Romero. Now, Veronica was reported missing around February 14th in 2004 by her family. Now, unfortunately, this is all the information that is available regarding Veronica's part in this case. What made it so difficult for investigators to identify these women as quickly as they wanted to was because, as I said, they were found in a mass grave. Remains were scattered all over the place, and so they had to piece together this entire puzzle and try to make sense of it. So this was, of course, going to take time, and it was going to take a lot of resources as well. However, be that as it may, remains were still pouring in in numbers, and families wanted to know, families had to know, what could have happened to their loved ones. So investigators were quite under a lot of pressure to solve this case. Albuquerque police also decided to reach out to police stations of other states as well to try to find out if maybe they could have had similar cases where women were being murdered and buried in mass graves. They thought perhaps they could come together, combine some heads, and see if something could be found. It was said that they looked around states like Texas and Arizona, but nothing indicates if ever this idea managed to help them out in any way. So Veronica was the sixth woman to be identified, and now we are going to talk about the seventh woman who was identified out of all the 11 victims. And this was 24-year-old Doreen Marquez. And Doreen was actually from West Mesa. So this case affected quite a lot of people because people knew her in that place. Now, it is said that she had two beautiful kids and she would always be throwing them these wonderful, wonderful birthday parties. And that is something that she will always be remembered for. Doreen also had a romantic partner in her life and they were quite happy together. They even moved in together. However, something ended up happening at some point and her partner was thrown in prison prison. And it is said that this ended up deeply affecting her, so much so that she, she ended up being involved in drug use and alleged sex work. Now, I want to be clear, in Doreen's case, it wasn't officially stated if she was actively involved in sex work. It is only a legend. And so also because of this difficult time that Doreen was going through, she ended up going missing. Now, there really isn't much clear information of exactly when she went missing. Some sources say that she was last seen in October of 2003, dropping her kids off at school. However, there is some information that her friends also stated that they did see her well into 2004. So it's a little bit... It's a little bit foggy as to when exactly Doreen went missing. But in terms of when she was reported missing, she was reported missing in December of 2003. So far, every victim that I've talked about in this case was identified to be Hispanic and also local to the Albuquerque area. However, the next victim that I'm going to talk about, the eighth victim uh, that was identified in this case, was not only found to be from outside the Albuquerque area, she was also identified to be a black teenage female. And on top of that, she was not reported missing by anyone in the area, so this made her stand out quite a lot from the rest of the victims in this case. Now, I gotta be honest, there really isn't a lot of information as to how they ended up getting to identifying her. There really isn't much to say as to what steps were taken, but they ended up identifying her as 15-year-old Celania Edwards. And uh, she was formally identified in November of 2009. It is reported that Celania had run from her foster home at that time and ended up finding herself all the way in New Mexico in Albuquerque, which is where she ended up losing her life. Now, shortly after the identification of Celania Edwards, the ninth and 10th victim were also identified. The ninth victim to be identified was 24-year-old Virginia Clove. And according to the people who knew her, she was such a funny person. And she had two brothers and she also did quite well in school. It is said that family was very important to Virginia. However, things also took a very bad turn when one of her brothers was shot and killed. Now, this greatly affected Virginia's family, so much so that her other brother ended up running away from home and was uh, there's nothing to indicate if he was ever found, whether alive or dead. So the family was very much affected by the death 
of one of Virginia's brothers. And even with her as well, it affected her so much that she also ended up running away from home. So not long after running away from home, she went to go live with her grandfather. And then shortly after that, she ended up having a boyfriend. Now, unfortunately, even with her boyfriend, she suffered another huge blow when her boyfriend was hit by a car and was put in a coma. And there isn't anything to indicate if he ever woke up from the coma, but unfortunately, he ended up losing his life. So after the death of her boyfriend, Virginia ended up losing the house that they lived in together and she became homeless and she started being involved in drug use and sex work. Her father also tried to help her to get her life back together, but it wasn't as easy as he would have hoped that it could have been. And even though she would keep in touch occasionally, it wasn't as much. But then around June of 2004, it really seemed like Virginia wanted to get her life back together. It is said that around that time, Virginia was talking to her father about a new man that she had met and she was speaking so highly of him that she felt like this man was the one, the one that she was going to marry and spend the rest of her life with. And her father was also happy about this. It really felt like his daughter was coming back to him. So he wanted to meet this guy. He wanted to know exactly who this guy is that Virginia is speaking so highly of. But unfortunately, not long after that, Virginia went silent and about four months later, she was reported missing. Then the 10th victim to be identified actually also ended up leading police immediately to the 11th and final victim that I'm going to talk about today. So the 10th victim was 23 year old Evelyn Salazar. Now Evelyn disappeared in March going into April of, two, of 2004 and she disappeared along with her cousin. Her cousin was identified to be 15 year old Jamie Barella and her remains were discovered shortly after the discovery of Evelyn's remains. Now, even though Evelyn was a sex worker, it is not believed that at this particular time, she was actively taking part in any sex work. As a matter of fact, around the time of her disappearance, Evelyn was spending time with her family. On the day of her disappearance, she had decided to take her cousin Jamie out for a walk. Now, unfortunately, this was the last time either of them would be seen alive again. And as I've already said, Jamie was only 15 years old at the time of her disappearance. Now, unlike the other victims that I've spoken about so far in this case, Jamie was the only one who was not involved in any sex work. Now, investigators could not determine the causes of death of any of these victims. And even around the crime scene, there wasn't really anything that could have helped them to identify what could have possibly killed all of them. And with that being said, there was also no foreign DNA on any of the victims to try to help identify anyone who could have been responsible for this. People in the community of Albuquerque had no idea. People had no idea that these women were missing. It was only once the information had been re revealed that people started to know that these women were missing and that there was a mass grave in West Mesa. So now that I've spoken about the victims of this case, it is time to get to the investigative side of it. And by that, I mean suspects. So as I've already stated, this case ended up being known as the West Mesa Bone Collector case. And the more the police investigated these remains, the more they got to think that this could have been done by the same person. They also believed that this could have been the work of a serial killer. However, there is nothing to indicate that anyone was named the official suspect of this case in connection to the murders of these 11 women. But of course, as time went on, a couple of men were brought forward and they were looked into as possible persons of interest in this case. So I'm going to talk a little bit about these men as well and i want to know what you guys think and what conclusion you might come to the first man that i wanted to speak about is a man by the name of fred reynolds who was known as a pimp at that time and he actually knew one of the missing women and it was said that he was found with multiple pictures multiple photos of missing sex workers so fred would have been an important person of interest in this case However, he ended up dying of natural causes in January of 2009. Now, this next man that I'm going to talk about definitely attracted quite a lot of attention to himself. His name is Lorenzo Montoya, and it is said that he lived less than three miles away from the burial site 
where these women were discovered. So it is said that back in 2006, there were some dirt trails that were discovered from his trailer leading all the way back to where the bodies were discovered. Lorenzo had been previously arrested for violent attacks against sex workers, and it was also reported that he had been known for also threatening his own girlfriend's life, and he threatened to bury her as well. And according to reports, it is also said that even Lorenzo's co-workers were stated saying that they heard him speaking about killing women and then burying them in West Mesa. And in 2006, Lorenzo actually ended up murdering. He strangled and murdered a teenage sex worker, but then nothing else after that could be done because he ended up being shot and killed by the young girl's pimp. And it appeared that after he was shot and killed in 2006, no more women were reported missing. When detectives were searching Lorenzo Montoya's home, they came across some home security footage which showed Lorenzo to be doing some questionable activities, some questionable sexual activities with what seemed to be the body of a dead woman. Then when the video switched to another part of Lorenzo's home, police reported that they could hear what sounded like Lorenzo tearing out some duct tape, wrapping something with it, or wrapping someone with it. So it is believed that Lorenzo must have been wrapping this woman's body in duct tape in preparation to go get rid of it. So now this would beg the question of, was he going to go bury this woman in West Mesa? Then in August of 2010, police decided to search places around Joplin, Missouri. And these places were associated with a photographer and businessman named Ron Irwin. And according to investigators, they confiscated tens of thousands of pictures from Ron Irwin, very questionable pictures. And it is said that he used to even frequent around the state fair in Albuquerque. But according to police, Ron ended up being cleared as a suspect in this case. So all the leads that they had regarding this man ended up leading to a dead end. Then a known serial killer known as Scott Lee Kimball claimed that he was also being looked into regarding this case but he denied being involved in any of these murders. Then in 2014, there was some sort of a breakthrough in this decade-long case when Albuquerque police caught wind of a man by the name of Joseph Blee. Now I know, I've thrown quite a lot of names at you so far in this case, so please stay with me. Now Joseph was dubbed the mid-school rapist, for his criminal activities back in the 1980s. Now, according to police, this sick man would break into homes where there were 13 and 15 year old girls who lived near McKinley Middle School. And once he did this, he would sexually assault these young girls. And in 2015, Joseph was suspected of killing a sex worker because his DNA was found inside the belt buckle of this sex worker's belt. And uh, this woman was found deceased in Central Avenue, which is a well-known spot for sex workers to operate in, in the eastern part of the city. And in addition to this, a tree tag that belonged to a nursery that Joseph was known for frequently visiting was actually found in the burial site, was actually found around the burial site where the 11 victims' bodies were discovered. And the reason police knew that it came from this nursery was because they actually traced it back to that nursery. And you know, it was found out that Joseph also had women's underwear and jewelry that did not belong to either his wife or his daughter at his home. And now even though this next part is alleged, I thought it would be interesting to mention just because I want to know what you guys think about this. Apparently, allegedly, at, at one point Joseph once told his cellmate that he had actually been with one of, one of the West Mesa victims at one point and he would even refer to them as trashy. And those were the persons of interest in this case, Ron Irwin, Joseph Blee, Lorenzo Montoya, 
Fred Reynolds and Scott Lee Kimball. Now, I don't. I just want to know what you guys think about this, especially with these suspects, Lorenzo Montoya as well as Joseph Glee. Now, both of these guys, they sound like the kind of people who could have done this, given the fact that Lorenzo even strangled and murdered a sex worker at one point. This makes him look like he would actually be capable of this. And the fact that his trailer has some dirt trails leading from, from it, all the way to the grave site where the victims were found, it really puts him in the light of he could have been the one who did this. But now when we look at also Joseph Blee, Joseph Blee also has some questionable characteristics to himself as well. And he also sounds like the kind of person who could have done this. Now, in my opinion, I'm honestly stuck between the two of them that either one of them could have been involved in the murders of these women. It's quite unfortunate that nothing so far has helped police identify who the killer could have been or to solve this case but i just want to hear from you guys what you think especially regarding these two men lorenzo montoya and joseph glee who do you think could have been responsible for the murders of these women and my other question is do you think we will ever get any justice for all these victims because even though they were involved in sex work and drug use no human being deserves anything like this. And what you do in your life does not get to, get to determine how precious your life actually is. With that being said, guys, that was the case of the West Mesa Bone Collector or the West Mesa Murders. I'm terribly sorry to the families who were affected by this, those who lost their daughters, those who lost their mothers, those who lost their cousins. I am so sorry for the loss that you all have experienced, and I hope, I deeply hope, that at one point in time, justice will be served for all of these women. Now, I just want to know as well from you guys in the comments what you think about this case. Who do you think could have been responsible for this? Who do you think could have, or was it one person, or could it have been more than one, one person? And I just want to know your thoughts as well, and please keep them kind in the comments. And the families of these victims sometimes they do actually get to go on social media to see what people say about their loved ones so please be kind in the comment sections but i do look forward to hearing from you guys so with that being said it's good to be back good to be back and i will see you again in the next episode when i talk about the next case and thank you again for all the support that you've been showing me so far and until next time please do stay safe out there look after yourselves and your loved ones and I'll see you soon.